of them, like uh, like I do. Mm. So it's a very interesting family, which uh, always uh, gives us new information, new takes on history, new angles to study, and uh, it's a seemingly seemingly um, inexhaustible uh, um, a fountain of knowledge for us to study the early modern period of European history. Welcome, uh, Gerard, and I give you the word. Thank you very much, Tom, for your uh, for your kind introduction. So, um, in this. Uh, moment I'm going to speak to you about uh, our research, I should say, um, on uh, Samuel and Joseph Palash as Moroccan Jewish diplomats between Fez, Madrid, Amsterdam and The Hague. And I, I'm going to focus on some new aspects, uh, at least for us, new aspects, I hope for you too, uh, of their lives. Um, and I will explain where this comes from and what we are doing. Uh, Tom Thielen has already said a little bit about it. But first of all, thank you, uh, David and Tom, for inviting me here uh, today. It's a, really a pleasure to talk about a subject that has indeed uh, kept me busy uh, for many years. Uh, and indeed, a new aspects coming uh, around the corner every so many times. Um, now I'm trying to get to the next slide. Uh, yes. Was it me who did it or was someone? Of, no, I did myself. Good. it's you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, the focus of my talk today is uh, some new evidence about the life of Samuel and Joseph Palash in Madrid and The Hague. So I'm, focus, I'm going to focus on Madrid and The Hague and I will explain uh, why. And I will new, take new materials from two court cases in The Hague to, um, to talk about uh, th that episode in their life. And uh, before starting, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Wim Heinen of Amsterdam for drawing our attention to these sources and for allowing, allowing us to use his transcript of the documents. Um, he had been working on them also for a long time. And uh, he draw attention to the sources which we did not know. And when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about my colleague Mercedes Garcia Arenal and myself. Um, and uh, we have been working on Palash uh, together since the end of the 90s, publishing first in Spanish uh, about him and then the translation into English, A Man of Three Worlds, and then uh, editions in Arabic, Italian, Dutch, Followed, and I will, as uh, Tom already said, a new edition in Hebrew published later uh, this year. Now, um, there are a lot of stories, a lot, also a lot of uh, um, myths, you might say, about Samuel Palash. He was a figure that already in his time, I think, uh, inspired uh, people around him and uh, kept them busy. Uh, a man who was born in Fez and uh, a, myth, a myth that we have ourselves been a little bit guilty of is uh, the thought that this uh, image on the, on the uh, book cover is Samuel Palash. Well, he is not. He is, in fact, uh, the man you see here is, uh, is derived from a painting by Rembrandt, uh, a painting uh, of a man uh, dressed in Eastern clothing, as you see. Uh, but painted after the death of uh, Samuel Palash. Uh, but I think it's an apt uh, image. We know that Rembrandt painted uh, Jews in Amsterdam and uh, may have been uh, acquainted with them also when he lived in his youth uh, in Leiden. Um, so uh, this to acquaint you with uh, the image here, inspired and apt for the book, but not Samuel Palash himself. Now I'm going to uh, discuss 
um, first of all, the background of uh, the family and this image of the Strait of Gibraltar is perhaps a good starting point for uh, my story because it sheds light. You see here the both both parts of the uh, of the Strait of, Gibral of Gibraltar, with the north side, of course, Spain, where the family must have come from. Uh, they all must have originated in Spain, but we do not know much about their backgrounds. That is to say, we know that the family called Palaj lived there, but we do not know the exact connection between the family we meet in Fez uh, at the beginning of the 17th century and how they were connected to family members in Spain in the Iberian Peninsula. But we must assume that they at some stage uh, fled Spain or, or migrated from Spain in any case and established themselves in Fez. And that's where uh, Samuel and his brother Joseph, who are most of the time the center, center stage of our uh, studies, because they operated often together. Uh, they are the, the, the main figures for our book. And we also already come across them at the beginning of the 17th century when they crossed the Strait of, the, uh, of Gibraltar together in the beginning of the 17th century. Going uh, from Morocco, and I'm going to speak about the background of their, uh, their travel to Spain, because uh, um, uh, as we know at that time, Spain was a territory that was not allowed for Jews to live in, except as what was called judios de permiso. Now, why did they go, to, why did they go there? And uh, what did they do in the beginning? And what uh, made them, in the end, leave um, Madrid to finally go to the Netherlands? Now, um, first of all, we have to take a look at Morocco uh, in this period. And uh, a towering figure in the, uh, 16th, in the 16th century Morocco was the Saadid Sultan Ahmed al-Mansur. You see, I'm going to take you out of Europe. But this is also because the Palash family uh, has their origins there. And in order to understand why they leave Spain or Morocco, we have to understand what was happening in, um, in Morocco. Ahmed al-Mansur, as I said, uh, was a sultan in the, in the, during the 16th century. He died in uh, the early 17th century. Um, he had made Morocco a unity, but after his death, his uh, heirs to the throne started to uh, fight one another and a sort of a civil war uh, broke out. And uh, this is probably one of the reasons that uh, the Palacios left uh, Morocco because the situation for the Jews of Fez and in general, the Jews in Morocco deteriorated very much with that uh, civil strife between the heirs to the throne in the early 17th century and situation it went very bad. So they left and they left to Spain and found, uh, uh, tried to build up a life there. Uh, and the background of what they were doing uh, then in the next few years has to be uh, uh, looked for in the situation in North Morocco where in the 16th century, the Spanish expansion led to the establishment of a number of footholds, strongholds on the Moroccan coast, occupied and built by the Spanish, but also by the Portuguese, in an attempt to expand uh, Christian territory into Morocco. And um, this led to uh, also pressure inside Morocco because the legitimation that sultans could find could be found also in the struggle against the Spanish and Portuguese who intruded the Moroccan coasts. And this led also to an internal strife for who was the best sultan who could, uh, uh, who was the best to carry out that struggle against uh, the Spanish. And after uh, Ahmed al-Mansur died, uh, his uh, heirs to the throne uh, fought for some time. And in the end, in 1608, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pretenders established his rule in, uh, in Marrakesh in the south. 
uh, you see it uh, here, here is Marrakesh. And uh, as we will see, uh, Samuel and Joseph Palash uh, became agent of that uh, Sultan. Now, uh, just to give you an impression, this was, this was the palace that uh, Al Mansur built in Marrakesh, the Badi Palace, which uh, he also purposely meant as an image to the palace that Philip II had built uh, in the north of Madrid, the Escorial Palace. So there was a competition between Spain and Morocco in many ways, but there were also international contacts, contacts between them, but of course they became, uh, they were enemies for the reasons that I know, don't need to explain very uh, lengthily. Uh, this is um, an image uh, that uh, expresses in a symbolic way these uh, relations you have here, a Moroccan ambassador of Al Mansur to England, Abdul Wahid Al Nouri, an image that you can find in uh, the University of Birmingham. Very beautiful uh, image of a Moroccan ambassador. Again, not Palash, it was a Muslim ambassador. So uh, let me briefly uh, give an overview on uh, some of the key events. I will return to them um, later on in my talk. So in 1603, um, the uh, Sultan Al Ahmad Al Mansur dies and a civil war, war breaks out. Um, 63 and 167, we find Samuel Palash and Joseph Palash somewhere between Morocco and Spain. They travel, but they attempt to uh, get a life, you might say, in Spain, in Madrid. Um, they make a living of trading, trading in jewels for uh, the Moroccan Sultan but also they try to intermediate between the Spanish and the Moroccans with regard to these strongholds. And one of the strongholds they occupy themselves with is the stronghold, is the, the, the place called Ar La Racie, Ala Arish. So that's, there, that's what we have discovered in the uh, Spanish archives about their earliest uh, stay outside Morocco and their, the living they try to make. What we also found is that they, that the sources speak of possible conversions, not of Samuel and Joseph Palash, but of their sons, in particular, a son of Joseph Palash, who is called Isaac Palash. And by the way, uh, in the sources that we have maintained in our book, the name Palash is always spelled with two L's, so that's the reason I, I know, of course, that uh, nowadays the spelling with one L is customary. But at the time in our Spanish documents we, and in their own handwriting, I will show you an example later on, they wrote it with two L's. So um, we hear about a possible conversion of Isaac and also Joshua and other son, but somehow they get into trouble with the Inquisition and the family decides to fly from Spain, going to first to the south of France, Saint-Jean-de-Luz. Then they go to the Netherlands, where uh, an entrance permit, a passport is refused. They go back to Morocco. And in Morocco, um, we know that Moulay Zaidan, who had then by then established himself there, um, uh, engaged Samuel Palash in about 69 as his agent. Now, this was a very meaningful period in the relations between Spain and Morocco, but especially between Spain and the Netherlands, because it was at this period that the so-called 12 years truce was concluded between the Spanish Republic, uh, the Spanish, the Spanish, the Spanish uh, Kingdom and the Dutch uh, Republic. So, uh, as I said, they traveled from the south of France, getting into trouble with the Inquisition to the Netherlands, getting a passport refused, return and then return as agents of the Moroccan Sultan to the Netherlands and are present. In any case, Samuel Palash is present. He seems to be the most important of the two, uh, being an agent present at the concluding of the friendship treaty between Morocco and the Dutch Republic in 1610 in The Hague. Then we see them in the first years 
uh, when they are in the Netherlands, we see a lot of activity in Amsterdam. But in 1611, uh, Samuel moved with his brother and children as agents to the Hague. And there we see a court case evolving in 1612, 1613, which we did not know about and to which uh, uh, Wim Heinen drew our attention. A court case which developed, evolved before the court of Holland. Uh, and we can conclude from the court case that Samuel and Joseph lived at that time in the city center of The Hague and had moved there. In these times, he develops different sorts, sorts of activities. I'm going to speak about that later on briefly. In 1614, he gets imprisoned in England. What happens here is uh, that during one of his travels, Samuel Pelage gets involved in uh, Corsair activities. Corsair activities that he develops uh, under the, uh, in the service of the Sultan Mulai Zaidan. But there is a very close cooperation with the Dutch here. And you might say that it's even a cooperation between Dutch and Moroccans in this kind of Corsair activity, uh, allowing the Dutch to evade the, the clauses of, the, of the, uh, the truth with the Spain, because under the truth, it was prohibited to attack Spanish ships, but under a Moroccan flag, of course, they could do it. Palash was on board of a ship that in the end, uh, in a storm was forced to go to England and there was arrested on the petition of the Spanish ambassador. And he stayed in prison for quite some time. Uh, returning to the Netherlands, he lived there for some time and then died in 1616 and was buried at Oudekerk and the Amstel near to the city of Amsterdam, the place where the Portuguese Sephardi Jews buried their dead by then. And it still is a very famous and beautiful uh, place. You can still visit it. Now, um, reviewing the review that I just presented, here we have uh, a letter, an autograph letter sent by both brothers from the south of France to the Spanish king, which we found in the uh, state archives um, in Spain. Um, and uh, here they say goodbye to the Spanish king, saying that wherever we will be, they say, we will be servants of your majesty. And you see that they say we are here at saint saint luz and that this it is, they are signing as Criados uh, de Su Majestad, the Western Majestad. So, servants of your highness, Samuel Palash, you see the two L's and Joseph Palash. So this is the moment they go from Spain to the Netherlands to return to Morocco and returning again to the Netherlands as agents of the Sultan. Between 1669 and 1616, um, Palash develops different activities. He is the agent of the Moroccan Sultan. As I said, he lives in The Hague at the time. He's also involved in the establishment of the Portuguese Sephardic congregations at Amsterdam. We come across his name and we know that he played an important role there. And we must assume that he traveled forth and back between Amsterdam and The Hague in this period. He also developed commercial activities. We see him trading with Morocco. But as I briefly explained, we can come back to that in the discussion. He was also involved in Corsair activities in the service of the Moroccan Sultan. That's a, perhaps a little bit of an euphemism to say that they did this in the service of the Dutch uh, Republic, but under a Moroccan flag. In any case, uh, this is a very interesting period of his life. And in the trial, uh, Palash was able to produce the letters that uh, the Moroccan Sultan had written to endorse him, to uh, authorize him as uh, a Corsair in his service. 
Um, I have already briefly said um, and show that when they leave in Saint Jean de Luz, they say we are still the servants of your majesty. Uh, when we look at all the materials that we found in, uh, in the Spanish archives, not only in uh, the state archives, but also private archives of the nobility, then uh, we have been able to conclude, Mercedes uh, Garcia and myself, that these contacts with the Spanish always remained. And um, that in the years between 1669 and 16, 1616, there were activities that he, there, are, there is evidence that he stayed in contact with the Spanish uh, crown and the Spanish authorities. Here, this is also interesting to show uh, to you, you have, a letter uh, that he was all, that also was written uh, when he was uh, active as Corsair in the service of Zaidan. Uh, here you see his uh, Arabic handwriting, Shemuel uh, Balash, Balash is uh, how he writes here. And this is a letter written in the framework of, of his activities. You also can find it in our, in our books. And this is in the end in 1615, a letter uh, written about Samuel Palash about winning him back to uh, the Spanish king. And the clauses that were already agreed upon, uh, allegedly, we don't know, because we have no further proof of what happened to uh, these uh, documents. We do not know whether he really intended to get back in the service of the Spanish uh, king again. He died very soon after. But in any case, we see how also the Spanish be, were stayed interested in him. If you look at the clauses, we can see that the Spanish were interested in how the role he played between the Dutch Republic and Morocco and uh, the knowledge that he had uh, from his networks uh, working in the service of the Moroccan and the Dutch. Uh, uh, and the Dutch. Here, um, and I'm now showing you some more uh, images approaching uh, the The Hague court cases. This is an image of um, the earliest or, or the, the early neighborhoods where the Jews in Amsterdam established themselves, Floyenburg, where they established the earliest uh, synagogues, uh, initially in the form of house synagogues, Later on, uh, this synagogue built after uh, in a later stage, the synagogue at the Houtgracht. But we know that the earliest synagogue in which Palash uh, was involved, Neve Shalom, uh, was in that same uh, area, that same, uh, that same uh, canal, where you now find Waterloo Plain uh, nowadays in Amsterdam. So that was where his early life uh, developed itself in, in the Netherlands. But then we have this other aspect, which so far we had not, we did not know much about. We did know uh, also from a famous story that was told by, uh, by Barrios, uh, who in, in one of his narratives tells us that um, he met at some stage the, the Spanish ambassador in The Hague when uh, the Spanish, when the, the, the peace treaty was concluded, we might imagine, and that uh, both refused uh, to, make, to make place for the other. So the, both coaches met, according to Barrios, and uh, the coach that carried Palash refused to make way for the Spanish ambassador's uh, coach. This might have happened here, and we know indeed from the sources that they made such a tour because all ambassadors coming to the Netherlands uh, did this. But whether that story is true is very doubtful because um, there is no evidence for um, a stay of uh, Spanish ambassadors to start with in this period. There was no Spanish embassy in The Hague in the period uh, that Spain was engaged in war with, Sp with uh, that Spain was engaged with, in war with the Dutch Republic. And also other aspects, it, it gives a mythical image, but, um, there was perhaps more to it because uh, we now indeed know that uh, you, have your, you have a later image that uh, Palash indeed established himself as an ambassador, as an agent in the city center in a house 
on which our core documents shed much more light than we had ever expected. Uh, here you see a later image, by the way, of a Moroccan ambassador presenting himself in The Hague in the 18th century, found it a, a nice image. We don't have it for the time of Palash. But we know that this happened this way, that the ambassadors came there. We know now, uh, on the basis of the court documents, that Palash lived at the Nobelstraat, Nobelstraat uh, an area where uh, different kinds of people from abroad, you might say, also lived, so ambassadors as well. In the, in the neighborhood uh, of, the, uh, of the Binnenhof, where also the court uh, resided and where the government until today uh, resides. So the court documents speak about a house where uh, Samuel and Joseph Palash lived. And the court documents tell us a lot about other Moroccan officials who in, lived in that house or were there. So we get the picture from these documents. I will refer you to our uh, publication uh, in Ivrit, in which we discuss this in more detail, uh, to know more about it. But it, it sheds a very interesting light on Palash's life as an agent in Morocco. And very interestingly, it also sheds light by this way on the very early uh, moments of Jewish life in The Hague, because we do not know, frankly, hardly anything about it. And very interestingly, where uh, Samuel Palash lived in Nobelstraat, his brother, Josef, after his death, later on moved to another part of The Hague, which then uh, a few decades later becomes, uh, be becomes the first uh, center of the Jewish communities in, uh, in The Hague. So the documents are very important in that respect also for the history of Jewish life in uh, The Hague. So that's where he lived. And here you have a present day, not so nice image of the Nobelstraat, but it gives you an idea in any case. Uh, so in the city center, here you have his uh, tombstone, uh, it Aurekerk aan de Amstel. It's a famous image, not so, image is not so well, but you see here, in a sense, the tomb also expresses the importance uh, Palash had. And we know in fact, that uh, when uh, he was buried, his uh, burial was attended by the members of the Staten General of the States General and Maurits, the state holder himself. Um, so this, these are the important, I'm sorry. These are the important images. I will show, go back to, oh, sorry, to this one, to this one. Now, let me now, briefly go to uh, the, the documents. What do they tell us about uh, life in The Hague? Now, they tell us uh, about um, a, uh, uh, an incident that took place. First of all, there are two related court cases. The first case starts with an incident in the city center of The Hague, when um, uh, members from the household went to a butcher in the city center and were uh, became involved in uh, in a fight. And the fight apparently, according to the, the court documents, started when they were walking there and the man uh, who uh, was called La Main, who was a, a military person, started shouting allegedly, shouting that he said, the Jews are coming, shouting that there were Spanish rogues. So they were seen here in the city center of The Hague as, Span as, as Spanish. Uh, and they were attacked for being associated on the one hand with the Spanish, the enemies, but they were also associated uh, for their Jewish identity, apparently. Um, a, a, a fight came into existence at. Uh, started and apparently at the first instance uh, the matter seemed to be uh, steam, se seemed to be arranged. Uh, the family members present had asked for apologies and the matter was indeed uh, drowned between the two parties. But then uh, um, when the family members came home, apparently Joseph, who is called the oldest ambassador in the court documents, this was also new uh, to us because we imagined always uh, that Samuel was the eldest, the eldest one of the two, 
but apparently Joseph is the oldest one, was not satisfied and told those who had returned to their house that he had made the peace with the attackers too easily and that fighting was the proper way to settle the matter. And at this moment, uh, Isaac, the son of Joseph, had an important place in the fight that occurred next, but was badly hurt at his uh, 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 his leg. And we know uh, from later sources that he indeed was never able to walk. He was called the limping, the limping one. And um, it so happened um, uh, that um, uh, this lifelong handicap uh, led to another case. But the first case was Isaac, Samuel and Joseph against their opponents, suing them for hurting Isaac and having hurt the honor of the Moroccan Sultan. Well, that court case involved high persons in the The Hague elite, because at the other side, the other party, there was a bastard son of, uh, of Philip van Hohenlohe, who was a very high official in a very high military man in the state's uh, army, in the state's armies. Uh, but then in the end, that uh, affair did not lead to a conviction of that opponent uh, and the matter was left. But then the second case started when Isaac turned against his father and his uncle, the court cases tell us, because he said, you wanted me to revenge the Moroccan Sultan. I did it for you. And apparently this led to tensions and the tensions are interesting. Uh, they have many aspects and the court cases take very long. But what is interesting for us and for uh, here is that they shed light on life in Spain and give us more information on the reasons why the family left Spain. Because uh, then uh, Joseph and Samuel Palash defending them themselves against Isaac Picture an image of a young man who uh, had caused a lot of trouble uh, already in Spain. And um, one of the reasons for the trouble was that apparently um, Isaac had asked to become a Christian. He wanted to become a Christian in Madrid. And um, in their defense, Joseph and Samuel gave an extensive report of someone who has been rebellious towards his father and uncle since they had already left Morocco and had come to Spain. They say in their defense, the boy had always been rebellious, especially after he had become older and started traveling and that they had, he had cost them a lot financially, but it also made them very sad, grote hartsweer in Dutch. Uh, Joseph and Samuel confirmed that they had always done their best to have him educated and without the court documents say, making any distinctions with regard to religion, which is so remarkable, I would say, when he seemed to have a liking for the Christian religion in Spain, they had allowed him to be schooled in a convent called La Merced and another called La Santa Trinidad, so the, the, the Holy Trinity. And they had allowed him to be schooled in a convent called La Merced Oh, I'm sorry, and they had hoped, and there were some agreements with the king of Spain about this, about this that Isaac would have a spiritually, spiritual and knightly habit, but he had behaved very badly and had mocked the Christian beliefs so that his teachers had wished to get rid of him. He had then been sent to Sauta, to the north of Morocco, and there had behaved very badly again, being violent even, and they would have punished him severely had he not pretended that he wanted to convert and that for, for that reason was again sent to Madrid to be educated. But as I said, he had he returned from the intentions and started disputations and had refused to step down from his horse and take off his head during a procession, a Maria procession in the streets to the embarrassment of important people who had witnessed this. And for this reason, court documents say he was sought by the Inquisition and would have been imprisoned if his father had not interceded for him. Things even got worse, however, and he had been convicted to prison in one of Castile's prisons for a while 
and was only freed by some high persons, among whom the Duke of Infantado, who for the sake of his father and upon receiving payment, and uncle had prevented this with great costs and effort. Due to the troubles with the Inquisition, the family had gone to Saint-Jean-de-Luz and there Isaac had even taken up the weapons with his father and uncle. In order to prevent that he would be imprisoned again, they had gone to Amsterdam. So here, uh, here we see something of the details. Uh, we don't know what, what, is the, what, what, what is true and what is not true, but it sounds, and it was all deposited before a court, it sounds uh, quite uh, authentic. And it is a pity that so far we have not been able to find any documents in Spanish archives uh, that would corroborate the evidence given here. But it explains something of the reasons for going to, uh, to Amsterdam and for, their, their, for them leaving Spain. So, uh, as I said, the documents give lots, lots of information about how they lived in uh, Morocco. Uh, sorry, in, in The Hague, and they tell us a lot also about the position that Samuel and Joseph Palash took here. And we get to know them here as uh, a father and an uncle who uh, had lots of troubles with this uh, Isaac. And from our previous research, we already knew that this was the case, but we had not found any evidence on the background of their uh, leaving Spain to this, uh, to this detail. We know indeed, indeed that in the end, Isaac converted to Christianity in the Netherlands in Jurt Vaas, uh, became engaged uh, in teaching Hebrew at the University of Leiden, lived for some time in this city. And in the end, we lose track of him. Uh, he goes to Morocco uh, and uh, we see him returning to Judaism. So um, the time forbids me to, to go into more detail into this, into this. But what I, what I think is important here is that these documents show more of the dynamics of this Moroccan Jewish family. It shows the internal tensions also caused by uh, their having to leave Morocco first, having to leave uh, Spain uh, in the second place a life that apparently was lived very close to the Dutch and Spanish elite. That is also uh, new and interesting uh, for us and we want to pursue that further. A life uh, in which many colorful and, uh, members of the elite also appear. And I will be happy to go into that uh, next time. So it shows you the dynamics of a diplomatic life, of a life of an agent in these power relations between Morocco, Spain, and the Netherlands at this period uh, in, a, in a family uh, that has really played an important part in these relationships. And I hope to be able to continue our research. And I'm sure that in the course of uh, our work, um, we will find more documents uh, and we hope to keep you involved in, uh, in our work. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, Ton, I will uh, try to unmute you. Um, can, can I sort of make an observation and then, then ask a question? Um, they, 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 they expected to get fair treatment in the Dutch court, which is perhaps quite uh, surprising at that time. Um, but, but also, I'm, I'm just curious as the nature of, of an embassy, because you, you mentioned there was a sort of a building yeah. uh, in which people were living. Is it is this an embassy as we understand it now, or is it just some rich merchant who is representing the state, or how, how did it work? Uh, well, um, we know that the States General paid for the house. Uh, and they also demanded, uh, in this case, the agent of, uh, of Morocco to live in Amsterdam, uh, sorry, in The Hague, uh, because Samuel at one stage proposes that, can I not, can you not also uh, allow me and can you not pay for my travels to Amsterdam? But they don't, they want him to live in, in The Hague. I think this is 
uh, not extraordinary. I think they asked this of the other ambassadors as well. And um, they did so with uh, this house, but apparently also the house that uh, Joseph rented afterwards and probably if probably maybe after that as well. So it's state demand apparently that you live there. But what was surprising um, to me, because it, it doesn't appear from any other uh, records, is that the documents we have make, make the impression that it was quite established. I don't think you would recognize the house as, a, as, a, as an ambassador's house. I, personally, I don't know. I have not done research on other ambassador's houses at this period. It is a period in which the, the Republic, of course, was very young. And this whole ritual of how to deal with diplomats uh, uh, comes into origin. Uh, but it is clear that uh, that for them they are uh, uh, they are there as agents, but um, there must have been a quite fixed um, let's say point of contact between the state, the, the Dutch Republic, and Morocco, because it was they who lived there. Uh, this is interesting because Morocco, of course, sent ambassadors. To, as far as we know. In the documents that I, I know, they were never called ambassador. Uh, here they are called, for the first time in the Dutch, as I said, in the court documents, he, uh, Samuel and Joseph are called the ambassadors. Mm -hmm. But yes. so far, we, all, uh, uh, we always assumed, and I think it was also, um, how do you say, um, uh, uh, corroborated by, by the other documents that they were not the ambassadors, they were the agents of the Sultan. Yeah. And the ambassadors were always Muslims and they would come and go. And uh, in this case, uh, also ambassadors I mentioned here, for example, in, two, in 1613, uh, there is an ambassador uh, mentioned who apparently lived in this house. And this was an ambassador whom we know, he went to the state, to the, to the Republic to talk about amongst other things, the uh, library that was robbed by the, by the French from the Moroccan Sultan and other uh, apparent, uh, uh, apparently important things. So it was a house in which the Palacios apparently lived, but also these Moroccan, these ambassadors stayed. Yeah. It's fascinating. Is, mm -hmm. is that an answer to your question? That they lived together in the same house at the same time. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah. And there were Muslim servants oh. also. Uh, and oh. there are different officials who who live there, uh, who are, uh, we come across um, uh, functionaries uh, uh, who are mentioned in the, in the, in the court documents, uh, who must have had different functions. For example, um, uh, let me see, yes. Um, uh, His Majesty's gate, Keep notice, maybe, but in any case, different kinds of figures who, who are uh, servants. For example, he um, uh, you you find this this man Ahmed Al Jazuli. I don't know whether that's correct. Guazuli, whose secretary Alal bin Musa lives at the house. His servant Ahmed ibn Muhammad, who was born in Marrakesh, who at this period has an age of nineteen. Then we have. Samuel Palash, servant, a man called Ruben Nachman, age 20, a man called Jakub Mordechai, he was a cook in the service of Joseph Palash. He was 19 years old in 1613. Uh, they had contact with the prince, uh, Isaac Palash had contact with, the, with a princess of Orange, and he had also uh, contacts with a court pastor uh, at this period, Alton Bogart. So quite important figures in the Republic they mm -hmm. frequented and were in contact with. Do you think it's, uh, you will ever find uh, if Isaac Palash was baptized uh, as a Catholic in Spain, in Madrid, would there be a possibility? No, I don't think so. As, as far as I can see from this, these documents, mm -hmm. they, uh, they left before that uh, uh, that happened. So okay. mm -hmm. we know of his Protestant conversion, but not of his Catholic conversion. 
<laughs> Otherwise, he would have been a man of four worlds. Yeah, yeah, Isaac, yes, yeah. Uh, this is all very fascinating uh, stuff, and it explains a lot of what happened in Isaac's life later on. This rift within the family uh, happened at a very young age, and it continued as it were all his life. But it also seems like he got back together with his family, or at least yep. had a working relationship with them. Yeah. The, the, um, the impression you get from these documents is that the family tries to pacify him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, accept that some, that he as a member of the family would convert to Christianity. Uh, maybe for, for protection of the unity of the family, you don't know, we have to study it further. Mm -hmm. So you also get the impression that there's also something um, as a psychological uh, element here in this, uh, this Isaac. Well, yeah. my personal theory, which we can now throw away, was that he was born a limp, and that caused ah. a, a psychological troubles, but that's not the case. Uh, no, apparently he got hurt at his, at his knee, at his meniscus, mm -hmm. during this fight, and he never recovered fully. And, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's in the court case. He there's one one detail that's very interesting, uh, where he says that um, he would never be able ever be able to live without a servant, so he would also need someone to to help him with everything. Hmm. Yeah. Yet he got married and uh, got eleven children, maybe yep. twelve. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, there's a question. Uh, um, from Bob Kozowski, who has uh, some experience uh, with archival sources everywhere. But what is it like researching in Morocco? Are uh, sources preserved and findable and accessible from this period? Yes, please. Sorry? Did you hear my question? Oh, I, I thought someone was on, oh, going to, then I didn't understand. Oh, no, so okay, sorry. I was relaying the question to you. Are archival uh, sources uh, uh, preserved, findable, accessible? In Morocco? In Morocco. Uh, not from this period, no. We don't have, uh, We at least we haven't found them. Um, so uh, it, it depends on how you define uh, Moroccan documents because we find doc Moroccan documents, of course, in the archives in, uh, in Spain, in, uh, in the Netherlands, but also in other places uh, mm -hmm. when documents were sent. So we have, um, we have documents that were produced in Morocco, but they are, we found them in, uh, in The Hague or in Spain in a different archive, but there are no uh, archival documents uh, from this period uh, in Morocco, which shed light mm -hmm. on, on, on uh, Samuel or uh, Joseph Palash. When you say that Samuel Palash was a corsair, does that mean that he was sort of on the ship himself with a parrot on his shoulder or just that he owned the ship that uh, participated in that business? I don't think he owned it, uh, but he he was on it, uh, and he probably had some sort of a function on on board. And we know because in uh, some of the documents, these are also kept in private archive. Uh, these are the the, uh, the collection that belonged to Moses Heimann Gans. Uh, we find that he was on the ship, and uh, one of the things that are said about him is that he had his meat kosher. Uh, so he was he, uh, uh, he was there yes and mm -hmm. apparently yeah so it, it's um... and uh, what is the relation between a corsair and his 
uh, and uh, the Moroccan uh, go government. And did he have letters that allowed him to be a Corsair? Was he functioning as a sort of government operator or was he more like uh, a private uh, businessman with the blessing of the state? Well, uh, in my, uh, oh, I don't know what it is. Um, in my, maybe I can switch off the. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. That's better. I should have thought so. Should have thought about it right away. Uh, uh, in my, in 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 our reconstruction uh, of the of the documents, um, this uh, it, uh, he he he. He could produce uh, a letter uh, when he was in prison. He could produce a letter um, from the Sultan, although not the original, but translated into French. Well, maybe there were two, two but in any case, he produced, a, he produced such a letter, a couple brief in, mm -hmm. in Dutch. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, so this was a legal was able to activity. show that this was that he was officially, let's say, uh, uh, authorized by the Sultan to do this. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> we know about how the, the the company of the ship was found, found, and this was done in Rotterdam. And uh, the, the, all the sailors were apparently Dutch. We also know this from the court documents um, from England. So this, this, I think there were also English persons. I, I don't, I, I would have to check, but mm -hmm. uh, they were not Moroccans. Okay. So uh, probably, as I said, um, it was the period of the 12 years truce. And in that period, it was not allowed for the Dutch to wage war against the Spanish. But this was, of course, a nice opportunity. And of course, you, you know, perhaps uh, that Maurits, the Stadtholder, um, uh, made part of the fortune, part of his fortune from the income out of this kind of uh, activities. Mm -hmm. So uh, what they did, we, we, we know quite well what they did, and that's why they went to Morocco. When they captured a ship, they would sell the goods in, in, in Saleh, and from there they would be brought to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So that's apparently, I don't know how, whether I can generalize that to all this, but all of this, but th yeah. in this case, this was the way it happened, apparently. Uh, so then it would come uh, by that way. What can, you, sorry. what can you tell us about the ancestors of the Palaces? Where did they come from eventually? Uh, were they Spanish, Portuguese? I think they were Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. I think they were Spanish, but as I said, uh, we do not know of exactly, let's say, the, the line of the family back to Spain. We don't know it, but everything points to the, uh, points to the origins in Spain, um, there's, uh, the way they spoke, uh, their customs. So they, they must have had a background in Spanish culture. They, mm -hmm. they spoke Spanish as, as Spanish would. Um, and um, in one of the later editions of our book, I found also a note in Barrios saying that they took pride in their Spanish uh, background. Now, okay. maybe yes. that is or, mythical, but I don't think so. That sounded, that sounded quite authentic to me, that they took pride in their Sephardic Jewish uh, background. Yes, uh, maybe some members of our uh, public uh, want to uh, post, want to uh, 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 po uh, pose a question themselves live. And raise your hand. Yeah, that would be you great. Want. Yeah, please. Can, can can I ask? Maybe this is a silly question, but do you, do you have a feeling of where Samuel Palash's personal loyalties lay? Um, I would, s um, 
I would say to a high extent with the family. Yeah. In spite of differences, uh, I think you can say that uh, he uh, he tries to maintain the integrity of the family and protect the fam different family members. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and of course the political uh, matter. Uh, that's different. These documents um, seem to indicate. Uh, that he himself did not um, consider conversion, so to speak. Um, but that uh, his attempt to live in Spain might in the end have, uh, have led to something like this. We cannot imagine that the family would have stayed in Spain and that Isaac would have um, got a, a high position uh, if the rest of the family would not have, uh, at least out outwardly, have uh, converted. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, we see him as an engaged member of the uh, of the Sephardic communities in Amsterdam. So maybe things shifted also. It's very difficult to to, yeah. uh, to tell. Maybe others have other ideas, but. Uh, Fran, Fran, you have a question. Yes, as a theatre maker, I do a lot of political and theatre about people, I'm fascinated by how they must have felt. Were they in a state of continual emergency or was it normal? I mean, did they write any stuff down about how they were feeling and their strategies and tactics or was it just a kind of normal life for them? How did they feel? Do you know? Um... We do not know much. We don't have, we don't have, uh, let's say, ego documents that uh, were meant for the family themselves, which we could use as reliable, uh, if, 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 if such a thing is possible, to, to use as reliable sources for their emotions and their feelings. We, Can you guess? Can you guess? Well, in this sense, these new documents need more need more study, uh, and they may help because the, uh, the 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 impression they gave give us so far um, uh, is that they um, they generally uh, attempt to maintain the, to maintain maintain the integrity uh, of their lives. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. And that that is a kind of balance that they're working with all the time. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, you, I think you have to understand their lives against the background. That's why I started with that uh, of the of the, the power configurations uh, of their time and the things. There were elements in which they seem to be, let's say, forced or. Uh, the moment they leave Spain for, uh, they leave Morocco for Spain, for example. The de deterioration of the of the uh, Jewish communities at that time, but at other times they seem to be, let's say, taking risks. That's that's maybe also an interesting aspect of their lives. Maybe yeah. tells us something about how how in any case Samuel was. I think um, Samuel seems to be the more ambitious, the more uh, uh, rule breaking of the two, whereas Joseph is more consistently in. He, I think he is more uh, defending the case of the, of the Moroccan sultan, whereas of Samuel, they, he seems to be more dynamic, so to speak, in, in, that, in that respect. And Isaac breaks out. And Isaac breaks out, yes, back. very much, yes. And, uh, but repeatedly. Uh, yeah. we, we knew uh, from the other sources that he was imprisoned for some time in the Netherlands, uh, and they really try to pacify to uh, to keep him but uh, it apparently is very difficult also to um, somewhere I think it says that the, the mothers are very the, the, his mother is very sad because of what is happening to him I would have to, to look it up I don't uh, I don't have it it's a very good question but I, mm. I would will have it be in your book? to get a, a good a good answer will it be in your book the answer no not yet no I, I, okay. because um, uh, we were only uh, able to 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 deal with uh, some aspects of the documentation mm -hmm. because we we uh, this is a translation of the book 
And we could, I think, write a separate uh, uh, monograph, perhaps mm. too much, but a good, solid, long article, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, Will there be a new edition of your book in English? Please. <laughs> <laughs> we are we have been discussing it i don't know uh, okay. we are we are extremely busy both of us with a current research project we are engaged mm -hmm. in a, a very large research project on uh, the cultural history of the quran mm -hmm. but maybe in a few years we'll find the time we have discussed it and we think it it would be uh it could be important. This is not the only new documentation we have. We keep finding mm. documents. It's very interesting yeah. also that people send us materials. Um, we mm. had uh, 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 someone who had been working in Mexican uh, archives and then uh, had done research on someone who had traveled, who had ended up in Mexico, had traveled in the south of France and makes a remark saying, I met here and here, I met Samuel Palash. It's it's really it's it's amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he tells very interesting details about him. Yeah. So it's not the end, and perhaps someday we'll write a new book uh, with all the documentation and mm -hmm. uh, and going into the details of all these materials. Yes. Ellie, would you like to unmute yourself? Or maybe I must do it for you. No. You need to unmute yourself, Ellie. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. I think Great. we have it now. So of most fast, my name is Ellie Gabay. I'm the president of the Spanish Portuguese synagogue. In you are muted, please. You've muted yourself again. Ellie, you've muted yourself again. You're still muted. Uh, perhaps go to Bernard. Uh, my, 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 my apologies, the phone call came in and it's always that way. To okay. be quick, um, I'm, I'm of Moroccan descent and, um, and uh, president of the Spanish Portuguese synagogue. So this subject is so fascinating for all of us at, uh, at the Spanish Portuguese world and the Moroccan world. You, told, you spoke about the sale of, and thank you, by the way, all of you. Um, you spoke about the sale of the loot and, and I was jumping in and out because of reception, but in Saleh, was that, was that what you said? Yeah. Okay, yes. so our tradition also says that there was a sale of the of the of the goods in Isawera. In today's Isawera, formerly Mogador, but obviously Isawera. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? And my last question, and I'll hang up after that. Mute myself. Is um, did that bring in some influx? Would you say of Ashkenazic Jews involved in the trade of that? Because we see some Ashkenazic names that come in after that period into that section of Morocco. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this question. Um, by the way, where, where, where are you based? <laughs> My curiosity, are you, you are based in Morocco? No, I guess. The... Oh, no. He's, <laughs> he's muted again. <laughs> Yes, in London, I think. He's in London. Okay, great. Uh, no, no, he's not. Uh, Any type, and I, I can, I can uh, tell everyone. Okay. okay. Uh, um, maybe, um, as I said, I, I'm not sure that I could generalize this. I, uh, I don't know how many. Um, I don't think there were many more Moroccan corsairs under Dutch uh, or, or in the Dutch service, so to speak. Uh, so I don't have any examples. Um, uh, and Asawira, I, I really don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm not <clears throat> not a specialist in the in the um, corsair trade. So should do should do more study into that. But this is what I gathered gathered from the sources that that they did it through Saleh, 
maybe to the Morisco uh, community, I don't know, uh, or the Safadi community, but probably also Moriscos were involved. We know about a lot of contacts between uh, Jews, of course, and Moriscos at this, uh, at this period. Ellie is in the uh, Philadelphia community, and um, we actually still need somebody from Philadelphia to to, to speak to us. So uh, we hope uh, we hope that will happen soon. Um, but Bernard, you have a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk, which was full of fascinating information. And um, please keep up the good work, because obviously people are going to keep sending you new documents, which will add to knowledge in the future. My question is fairly simple, and it's about the name. You've said about the name originally being Palliage. Um, but I know that I've read in two or three different sources, I just can't find them at the moment, um, that the name was Palacios or Palacios mm -hmm. in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, and that that may predate the Palliage. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you have any information on that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. I didn't say anything about the origins. I just showed you uh, his signature in contemporary Spanish, his autograph signature, and the way he signs in, in, in Arabic. So reading it aloud, I would get balayage, palayage. But I didn't say anything about an earlier stage. I, I'm not sure about, <clears throat> I should have checked in your company, but um, I know about the palacios, but I'm not sure about whether this is the origin, this is an earlier stage of the name. I don't think so, I must say. But there are, as you know, uh, people who find the name already in Al-Andalus in the 10th century, but I, I don't, uh, uh, it's interesting research, but I don't see any evidence of connections. That's why I'm, I'm hesitating. I have no new evidence. You, I would refer you to to others who Korkos uh, and others who have done that kind of uh, research. Um, maybe Adam Baum wants to say something uh, at this stage. Can, yeah. Well, it's my usual advertisement. Um, and in fact, during the course of this call, I, of this Zoom, I had a, uh, a conversation with Ralph Palash about, on the subject. Um, um, we are, the Avotino DNA Project, of course, has been testing men all across the uh, Jewish world, among them Eli Gabay, who was driving his car in Philadelphia. And uh, we've learned many interesting uh, things, and uh, Anna de Pass and her brother uh, and many others in this group we've tested and we're looking for a palash. Uh, for some reason, it's an omission on our part and we can't possibly have a survey of the Sephardi community without having a palash. So we're gonna try to find someone. We'll try with Ralph, but if you, any of you others, uh, such as Gerard, if you happen to know a palash male uh, who'd like to participate carrying the surname, we'd be very interested in testing him at our expense and uh, he would be anonymous. And uh, although we may want to discuss the overall results for the family uh, mm. in terms of its origin over the centuries, that often uh, is illuminating and understanding how that, how that particular population, how that particular lineage found its way into the Jewish population somewhere. So that's my ad. And of course, anyone else who's in the Sephardi or non Ashkenazi world who would like to participate should also contact me as well. And uh, my email address is Adam Brown at avotenudna.org, and I'll type this in right here. And that's it, that's my 10 seconds. Thank you very much, David and Tan, for uh, al allowing me to uh, share your uh, your uh, yes. program for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, this was a great uh, start. Gerard, this was tremendously interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. David, are there any questions on YouTube? Um, there was just one question, whether, whether there were any documents uh, in Hebrew which I, I suspect not. Mm, not, that I, uh, not that I could relate directly to Samuel or Joseph Palash. I know there are, but I didn't study them. There are some documents I think associated with authors called Palash in, uh, in uh, Etzheim in Amsterdam. Yeah. But I, uh, there's so much to discover. I don't know about relation, about who this was. We are, 
<clears throat> we are, we uh, have been working on some Appalachia and there is a lot to be done on the genealogy of, of the family and other, um, uh, other members, of course. Uh, so someone perhaps could do that or uh, have a look at uh, the Etz Haim and see what's there. Or further work, of course. Yeah, and perhaps Tom will uh, do this. Yeah, I've been yeah. working on it for some time now, yeah. but there are still uh, some el elusive palaces uh, running around everywhere. <laughs> Uh, uh, especially in the 17th century, there are some in Morocco, yeah, and yeah. they seem to travel to the east. Uh, Ajaka Palace is in Egypt at the time yeah. of uh, Sabatai III, and there were others. And we have all these uh, uh, lone individuals whom we can't uh, integrate into the family. As far as I can see, there are three main branches. Uh, there's the one from uh, Samuel and Joseph Palash, which uh, goes on to uh, Hamburg, uh, comes back to Amsterdam, goes to London, goes to Jamaica, uh, uh, to the US. And there's another branch uh, originating from Italy, going to uh, Gibraltar, from there to London, and from there also to Jamaica and to the Americas. And there's a third branch in Turkey, Izmir. Hmm. And the first one of that is a Jacob, circa 1750. And we don't know where he comes from. Hmm. So there's a lot of work to be done yet, and I, I, I don't know if we can uh, draw conclusions unless we get DNA from all three branches. Mm. That would be uh, uh, helpful, I think. And there are a lot of palaces whom we will simply will not be able to, to place within the framework of one genealogy. David, uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Yeah, th th thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. It was such a, they're, they're such an interesting family. Um, and um, I, th I, think, I, I think we shall return to them quite soon. But, um, okay. And um, we'd just like to, of course, uh, thank uh, Gerhard and thank our uh, patrons and thank also everyone who has joined us on YouTube. We are going to uh, take, take this talk uh, down this evening. Uh, it will be put back on YouTube um, after the book has uh, been published and hopefully, hopefully we can get some, some nice discount for, um, for uh, our, our members. But uh, turn over to you. Yes. Thank you everyone for watching us and thank you for those watching us on YouTube. We hope to see you again next week. We'll, we'll announce our speaker uh, on Wednesday. And uh, most of all, thank you to uh, Gerard for a fascinating talk, uh, revealing uh, new information that will be um, covered in this, uh, partly in his new book and hopefully uh, later in uh, in a separate article or a new English version of Samuel Palash, A Man of Three Worlds. And thank you to our patrons again for making this possible and see you next week. And again, right. I invite you back on after this meeting has ended for a short talk. I will stay. Thank you. Good, good night, everyone.